If you spend any time on social media, you have most likely seen those videos that are out there that take like a, a craft or a meal or some sort of uh, thing that you put together and they condense it down into about a, a two minute video. It, you know, they film it and it probably takes five minutes, but then they condense it out really fast to show you that the preparation and all this is really that, that easy. Like you can see it on Facebook all the time, like a, a recipe for monkey bread. Isn't monkey bread so good? You ever had monkey bread? Oh. I saw they sprinkled bacon on it. I didn't even know that was legal that you could sprinkle bacon on top of monkey bread. So good. But they have this, this video. It's condensed down and they have everything measured out precisely. And they do the steps without making any sort of mistakes. And it's all done in this uh, pristine you know, form and fashion so you get the product at the end. You'll see those things happen with these crafts or these meals or different construction projects. You know, life hacks, do it yourself. I used to be impressed by those, but then I, I really figured that's not real life. Okay, real life cooking doesn't go like that or the crafts that you make don't go like that. It was people who put these five minute you know, videos together. They have everything pre-measured, all cut, everything's all put together. I said, come cook that meal at my house, okay? And if five boys are running around and there's a barrage of Nerf guns being shot through the air and bullets flying and uh, baseballs and basketballs are coming through there and there's yelling and screaming and wrestling, which then turns into hurt feelings, which turns into hugs, which then somehow those hugs turn into more wrestling. I don't know how that happens, but it always happens with the boys. It just goes into more wrestling. Try to cook that perfect meal in the real life circumstances. See, I'm not impressed when you can put something together and it's all cookie cutter and you can make it without having real life happen around you. It's like that with theology though. I'm not really impressed with people who can sit down in a chair and spout off tons and tons of theology, but it doesn't have any application to real life. Like, what really happens when the rubber hits the road? What happens when you go through a difficult time? You know, what do you talk about when you talk about God? How do you pray when you go through difficult things? And what I love with what we're going to look at this morning in the life of Jesus is he was a man who instructed his disciples how to pray. You have that in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15. He instructs his disciples how to pray, but that is not a cookie cutter thing for Jesus where he just teaches on it and doesn't live it. Today, we're going to look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. At the darkest moment, his most vulnerable that he is before God and really how he prays. And what you will see is the echoes of the prayer that he taught his disciples is exactly what Jesus lives out as he faces the most distressing time of his life. Why don't you turn with me to Mark chapter 14. We're going to jump back into our series in the gospel of Mark. And what a picture for us today of the life of Christ as the burden of bearing the sins of the world comes upon his soul, how does, he re- how does he react? What does he do when he feels great distress, great sorrow? How does he handle these types of things? We get a glimpse of that in Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. Follow along as I read. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here, while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. What an account we have here with Jesus. Is this what you would expect the Son of God to be doing moments before he faces the greatest trial of his life? Is this where you expect the one who has shown his authority over demons, death, disease, conquered every foe that's come into his past? Do you expect the vulnerability of Jesus, this distress, this sorrow to be the outcry of his soul as he starts to walk towards the cross? 
See, if you remember with us, just the last time we were in the Gospel of Mark, it was about five weeks ago before we went through that discipleship series. Where was Jesus with his disciples? Just having that intimate fellowship. The last supper they were gonna have, the last Passover, which then transformed into the, what we do with the communion. Now Jesus was breaking bread, showing what the new covenant was gonna do. Great time of fellowship. Then they spent time singing hymns together and being refreshed in his soul as he's worshiping God with those who are closest to him. And then what happens with the disciples? Jesus predicts. Old Testament says the shepherd's gonna get struck and everyone's gonna flee. What does Peter say? Not me. I'm, I'm ride or die, I'm here. I'm not leaving you, Jesus. Uh, no matter what, I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna go after you. All these people could leave you. I would never, ever do that. And then what do the rest of the disciples do? They swear the same thing to Jesus. And then we come upon this scene in the garden. Notice verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, which means olive press. So there are olive trees around. You would uh, make olive oil around there. And we know it's a garden, not from this passage, but I think John 18 says it's the garden of Gethsemane. And one of the other gospel accounts says that this is a place that Jesus was accustomed to going to with his disciples. This was a place where he would go to find that respite, to, to find that time to be away. So they spent time there often, which is very interesting to think about the psyche of Jesus. If he were really trying to you know, get away from the responsibility and really hide from Judas, who he knows is about to betray him, would he go to a place that he was so accustomed to going to? Well, I don't think so. But because he knows it's imminent and because he knows the betrayer's at hands, he starts to feel what the text says. So he's bringing his disciples along. He has the 11 with him because Judas is gone. And he says to the 11, sit here while I pray. It's so great that we have Jesus as a man devoted to prayer. I think Spurgeon said in a lecture to my students, he said, uh, watch out for limping preachers. Limping preachers are those whose preaching leg is longer than their praying leg. He wants you to have a, a balance when you're a preacher. That just as, uh, as you are so emphatic about preaching the word of God, that you are also a man of God devoted to prayer. And haven't we seen that in Christ, just that balance? Yes, he's always there to proclaim the truth of God's word. He loves to teach that stressed over and over again in Mark. But how many times have we seen him pray? Mark 135, long day of ministry, doesn't deter him. Up early in the morning doing what? Praying. Chapter 6, 46, long day of ministry, sends the disciples ahead of him so he can get some time to, to pray. But in none of those do we have the account of the words that Jesus prayed until now. Look what he says. He takes with him now. He, he's going to leave the 11. And he's just going to take three with him. So he takes Peter, James, and John from those 11, and he brings them with him, I believe, for a purpose. We'll get to that in point three. And he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Jesus is starting to feel that, that weighty burden. Jesus has this distress, this sorrow, this gloomy cloud that is coming upon him. And so he does what is very smart. He's not one to keep that internally. He's telling that to his most trusted friends on the earth. He's bringing with them for one of the purposes, I think, to shoulder the burden of, of this great distress that he has on his soul, this dark night that he's about to spend. He's asking his friends to come along and to be with him and to bear with him as he's going through this. My soul is troubled to death. Look at verse 35. And going a little further, you could probably translate it, while he was falling to the ground, he was praying before he even hits the ground. But why would you go to the ground unless you are in complete, utter hopelessness? You lay sprawled out because you don't think there's any other recourse for you to do than the action that follows next. And Jesus, as he's falling down, is just praying. And notice what he prays. That if it were possible, the hour might pass. So he's starting to appeal to God. And he's going to God and he's basing it on the, the possibility, the power, the strength of God, which is a great thing for us to think about in the Gospel of Mark, because we've seen great examples of Jesus just exerting the power of God, haven't we? We've seen Jesus defeat demons, death, all of those things, all these miracles Jesus is able to accomplish by the power of God, but I think it's seen so clearly in the rich young ruler. Remember, the rich young ruler comes up, and he wants to come into the kingdom of God on his own terms. Chapter 10, I want you, Jesus, to let me in because I'm a good person. I've got status in the community. I've got riches. I've got everything. I just need you to let me to come in on my own terms. And Jesus 
won't have anything to do with that. Only through repentance and faith, when you renounce all things and you follow Christ purely because he is the son of God, will you be welcomed into the kingdom of God through repentance and faith? And so he's, he tells that to the rich young ruler. Listen, you need to renounce all that stuff that you love instead of me and come follow me. And what does the rich young ruler do? Walks away sad because he has great possessions. The disciples then, they're flummoxed. They're like, okay, what's going on here? If this guy who's got good morals, a good religious person, status in the community, really rich, if this guy can't get into the kingdom of God on his own merits, then how does anybody get saved? And what does Jesus say? With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the greatest example of the power of God is his ability to give salvation to those who are destined for hell, to give them spiritual life. With man, it's impossible to do that. But with God, he has the power to convert a sinner who's on the road to hell and bring him into the kingdom of God. So Jesus rightly appealing, God, if this is possible, if there is any power in you to do this, I'm gonna ask that you do it. Then we have it in verse 36. And he said to him, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Do you expect those words from Jesus? Is that what you thought he'd pray? Don't you think it'd be something like, give me the ability to handle this? Or Father, help me to have the strength I need to do what you're calling me to do. No, he's asking for the cup to be removed from him. So what does this teach us about Jesus? Well, I think it's what, what it's gonna do is it's gonna give us a greater insight into the person of who Jesus is. And whenever we get that, we should worship. So why don't you write this down, number one, on your outline this way. We need to marvel at the person of Christ. As we work through this, we need to marvel at the person of Christ. If we are worshipers of Jesus Christ, we need greater clarity, a full picture of who he is. And every time we get that, that should lead us to worshiping him. So we need to marvel at the person of Christ. And this text is so clearly going to give that to us. We need to marvel at the person of Christ. Let's worship him because of how great he is. But did you expect that prayer? Verse 36. Let's just look at the components of it. Abba, Father. Notice the intimate connection that he has with God. He has an Aramaic term, Abba, Papa. And then he's got the Greek term for Father. Just highlighting the relational connection that the Son has with the Father. So that deep fellowship that he shares with God is being highlighted by Jesus. I know that this is my relationship to you. This is how we have related eternally. You are the father who has loved me. I am the son who loves you. Then he goes from the relational component to the character of God. All things are possible for you. Now that's a great focus on Christ because he moves from the relationship he has to God to the power that God possesses, the strength that he has. And God, I know that there is nothing too difficult to you. Or to quote Job 42, I know that none of your purposes can be thwarted. So this is exactly what Jesus should be appealing to at this time. God, I know all things are possible for you. And because all things are possible for you, I'm going to come and appeal to you to work because I know you're a father who cares. Isn't that how he said it in Matthew? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more is your heavenly father going to give to you? So the heavenly father who can do all things. If you're a dad out there, you get that. Just imagine as a father, your child appealing to you in their darkest time and you having the ability to help them. It would take a second for you to do it. You would drop everything. You would exhaust every resource to be there for your kids. So this is exactly the way that he should be appealing to the father. Notice the bold request, though. Remove this cup from me. And then the humble resignation. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Did you really think Jesus would pray that? Have you been following along in the gospel? Is this news to Jesus that this cup is coming to him? Is this like, did Jesus forget his mission, why he was sent to earth? Do you remember Mark 8, 31, when he started to really instruct the disciples and he started to show them, this is why we're going to Jerusalem. He said, the son of man must suffer many things. That, that word day, that must, that's obligation. This is the plan of God. Jesus is not forgetting this at all. He knows that's the reason why he was sent. 
In fact, why don't you turn with me to John chapter 12. Listen to this. Listen to the way that Jesus frames it in John 12. John chapter 12, verse 27. Very interesting the way that Jesus is going to frame this. On the road to Jerusalem, he told his disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to be risen. This is why we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to give my life as a ransom for many. John chapter 12, look at verse 27. Notice Jesus talking about that same sorrow. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Isn't that almost the exact opposite perspective of what we have in the garden? What, what should I say to God? Save me from this? No, this is the purpose for why I came. So why now in the garden of Gethsemane, when the, the betrayer is eminent, Judas is about to stab him in the back, why is it now okay for him to say, God, remove this cup from me? This is where we begin to marvel at the incarnation of Jesus. Because I believe by looking at that, to see Jesus, to say, remove this cup, nevertheless, not what I will, but you will, we, we get two great evidences here. First, we get the evidence of his 100% authentic divinity. And then we see, united with that, his 100% authentic humanity. The incarnation, we, we have a, a clear picture, probably the clearest that we can see, rolled up into one episode here. In 1 Timothy, it's described this way, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it begins to describe what the incarnation is. It's a great mystery to think that the second person of the Trinity the Son of God came down and took on flesh. And the fact that he is 100% God and doesn't lose any of that, and yet adds on humanity to himself so that he might come and live the life that you and I were called to live, be able to die the death that you and I are unfortunately going to suffer if we don't repent of our sins, and then to rise again three days later to accomplish that is a great mystery. But here, we see a great picture. Why do I say that? Because I believe this prayer of Jesus, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, yours be done, shows us clearly his divinity. I think this is the only response that Jesus could give at this point. If he is truly God himself and truly the second person of the Trinity, it's really the only request he can give. Why do I say that? Turn with me to John 17, just a few chapters over. We were just in John 12. Go to John 17. Why do I say that? Think through this with me. John 17, verses 1 to 5. This is highlighting the divinity of Jesus. He is 100% God. John 17, verses 1 to 5. It says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, and he's talking about the upper room discourse from chapter 14 to 16, where he was just with the disciples, he said this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we see a great equality of the divinity of the son and the father there. Salvation is found, eternal life is found in knowledge not only of God, but also of his son, Jesus Christ. We see great equality there. And then take a look at this. I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now father, verse five, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus, before he takes on flesh, is dwelling in the glory of God. He is sharing in equal essence the glory between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there is such great unity and harmony and beauty and majesty wrapped up in that, that really, the way the Apostle Paul says it, no eye could see or understand or mind comprehend what God has promised to see that coming day. Right now, we can't even really fathom that. But that's where Jesus was before he takes on flesh. When he takes on flesh, though, now, now there is this, this sense of a distinctiveness where now the Son is here, and he's asking for the restoration of that glory with the father that he gave up right to, you could say, when he took on flesh. 
What else did that look like? Look at verse 24 of John 17. Look at verse 24, John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So the affection that was there between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before Jesus comes, that's again in that humility that he comes. He's renouncing that harmony to be able to come, not to be served, but to serve. And now he's realizing this is the point where I'm the closest to the break of that harmony, to the break of that fellowship. And it's gonna be broken in the moment when he cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus is going to cry on the cross. And why does he have to receive the forsakenness of the Father when all he's deserved, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. There's only been affection, there's only been glory, there's only been love, and now he's going to be treated as if he was sin on our behalf. It's really the only response that the divine Son of God could give. That harmony and unity is the essence of what it means to be God. But in his wisdom, allowing him to take on flesh, he can somehow accomplish this redemption and allow the justice of God and the mercy of God to stand. I think we see the full divinity of Jesus here. But I think we also see his full humanity, don't we? I mean, he is distressed. Jesus has said he's sorrowful. One of the other gospel accounts, remember it? Looks like he's sweating great drops of blood. There's a physical toll coming on the humanity of Jesus as he is authentically and truly and faithfully trying to walk as the perfect substitute for man. This is Jesus living out what it means to be the second Adam. The first Adam came and failed in full glory in the Garden of Eden with really no opposition. And then Jesus comes in full humanity with all opposition against him and faithfully lived as a man so he could be the perfect substitute for our sins. And these moments of prayer, like we talked about a few weeks ago, are the strengthening of the Son of God to accomplish what the Father has called him to do. Go with me to Hebrews 4 to see this. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verses uh, 14 to 16 and just marvel at the incarnation, this great mystery. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, full humanity, the son of God, full divinity. Let us hold fast our confession for we do not have, have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you see that with Jesus? This is what's going on. Jesus, the full son of God, yet full humanity, walking through this life, receiving all the temptations that Adam faced, that you and I face at every single point. He never failed. He was always perfect. So he could die in our stead and give us his perfect standing in God's eyes. How is that accomplished? Turn to chapter five, verse seven of Hebrews. This is amazing. Watch this. Hebrews five, seven. Watch what it says. We read this a few weeks ago in our... Um, Bible reading before our public reading of scripture, Hebrews 5, 7. Look at this. In the days of his flesh, okay, the humanity of Jesus, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Do you understand that this is how Jesus is working out the human component of his life? Not strolling through life with no care, as just God himself bouncing all temptations off him as if they don't affect him, but in humble submission, holy resignation to the Father and going to him and asking that he would be given the strength from the God who is able to raise the dead and save him from death. And watch this, he was heard, why? Because of his reverence, because of his faithfulness, because of his holiness. 
Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being destined by God, a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. So you and I have an eternal source of salvation because 100% God and 100% man were united in Jesus Christ. And in the garden of Gethsemane, we see that play out in the life of Jesus. He is sweating drops of blood. He's pleading with the Father. His soul is distressed. And yet this is God himself who created the world. This is the mystery of the incarnation. See, what this brings up for us is the topic of peccability versus impeccability. Maybe you've heard those terms before, theological terms. Uh, the impeccability of Jesus is a camp of people who believe that Jesus was not able to sin. Impeccable, pecari, to sin. Impeccable, he could not have sinned. Then there's a group that is the peccability of Jesus. That means Jesus has the ability, he could have sinned, but he never did. So both camps say he'd never sinned. One says he actually could have. The other camp says, no, he couldn't have impeccability. I believe you have to affirm the impeccability of Jesus. Because if we're really gonna confess that he is 100% God, James 1, God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone to evil. God's eyes are too pure to even look upon evil, Hebrews. So if Jesus is authentically 100% God, it is impossible that he could have sinned. But what's lobbied against those people from the other camp that says he could have sinned, the peccability, is that then, what about the, the temptations of Jesus? Were they real and authentic? I want to ask them the question, have they read the account of the Garden of Gethsemane? Was that authentic temptation towards Jesus? Did he feel the weight of that temptation? See, I go with C.S. Lewis on this quote, which is a, a wise thing. He says, you don't know the full power of temptation by giving into it, but by standing up against it. And he says, you don't know the full strength of the wind if you lie down, you know it if you stand up against it. And so Jesus knows really better than all of us what the fullest force of temptation is because he never gave into it. That doesn't mean he didn't feel it. He felt it to the uttermost, what it meant to depend upon God. So I believe you have to affirm the impeccability of Jesus. But then I don't want you to think that that just means Jesus sauntered through life like bullets off of Superman's chest. So I like to think about it this way. I think Jesus couldn't sin because he was God. But then you answer this question. He didn't sin because he was a faithful man. And when you talk about it those two ways, now you're talking about the incarnation in the correct way. He couldn't have sinned because he's God, but he didn't sin because he was always faithful to do the will of the Father. Let me give you an illustration that might clarify that for you. If you're into like uh, acrobatics or like daredevil height type things, Nick Willendia might be a name that you've heard of before. He's done these great tightrope walks before. He's done... I don't know if he did the Grand Canyon, but he did Niagara Falls at one point in time. A tightrope across Niagara Falls, and he tightrope walked it. It's an incredible feat. He was, uh, signed a contract with the TV company that was going to promote that, but they got really nervous. Like, hey, this guy might be the champ, might be a great tightrope walker, but we can't really take the risk that uh, on a family television program that you plummet to your death uh, while you're walking across this thing. You know, we have hope in you, but, you know, the water could come up, wind could come, something could happen. So we're really nervous about this. So what we'd like you to do, Nick, is we'd like you to tie a tether around your waist that we will then connect to the tightrope. It, will be, it won't be taut, it will be loose, it will not offer you any support. All it does is prevent you from falling to your death. So let's answer the question. Why couldn't Nick Wallendia, who walked all the way across there and did it perfectly, accomplished it, why couldn't he fall to his death? He couldn't fall because he was tethered to the rope. But why didn't he fall? Does it have anything to do with the rope? Or does it have to do with the fact that he walked every step accurately, faithfully, perfectly? See, two different questions still accomplishing the same answer of why he couldn't fall. And that's the same way that we look at it with Jesus. Yes, he couldn't have sinned because he was God. But that's not the reason why he didn't sin. As a man, he faithfully followed after God. 
And because he did that faithfully, he's the source of eternal salvation for us. This is the mystery of the incarnation. For you to look at Jesus and go, that you would humble yourself when you had that relationship, that love, that glory, to come die for me when I was your enemy. You would live a life where you faced a full blunt of temptation and you never sinned once. So you could stand in my place and now your perfect life is accredited to me and my sin is put on your account so I can go to heaven. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You need to marvel at the incarnation. That's what I think we see here. Let's go back and look at Jesus' prayer a little bit more specific. Look at the prayer, Mark 14, verse 36. And he said to him, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So we believe this is expressing who Jesus is. And this is a prayer I think that Jesus is offering so he can find the strength to remain faithful. But at the same time, I believe it's a teaching component for the disciples that he's brought with him, Peter, James, and John where they should learn from this because as they're going to face different temptations and as they have their sorrows, they need to know how to faithfully live in the presence of God. As I read that prayer, did you hear all the echoes to Matthew 6, 9 to 15 in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven. So Father, the relational aspect. Holy is your name. Character study of God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, the will of God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I mean, it's almost systematically, point through point, the way that he instructed them to pray, this is how Jesus himself is praying at his greatest time of need. So not only do we marvel at the person of Christ, number two on your island, I think we need to mimic the prayer of Christ. We need to mimic the prayer of Christ. What we see Jesus do here as our perfect representative, the second Adam, is so incredible. And what you and I need to be doing when we face our greatest sorrows and temptations. Do you think that it's possible for a Christian to experience sorrow, distress, grief, despair? If you're brought up in a system and taught that that is not... um, going to be able to commingle with Christianity, you've been brought up in a wrong system. Because the very founder of our faith, what was Jesus called in the old hymn? Man of sorrows, acquainted with much grief, or to quote Isaiah 53. Christians will experience these things. They will experience great sorrow, and at those moments, what do you do? When you're brought to those moments of greatest weakness, greatest distress, greatest burden, where do you go? And if the son of God, who at any moment could have appealed to his own divinity, showed us that you have to go to the father and receive the strength because all things are possible through him, then that's where you and I need to go. If you're in a system where they say Christians should never be sorrowful, they should only be happy, I'm telling you, grab your wallet because in a moment, they're gonna ask you for some money and they're gonna tell you this is how you get happiness, by giving us money because that's the only way that that type of system could work. But Jesus himself shows you will feel this. Now you and I have different temptations. See, we have the temptation in the flesh because we're sinful to be sorrowful over wrong things. And it is possible to find despair over you know, unmet expectations or not having the American dream or, or li- different idols in your life. It is possible to feel sorrowful for that. But as a Christian, who tries to live for God in a world that is so diametrically opposed to God, what do you think is going to happen over you? If you try to live faithfully for God, you will start to feel great sorrow when you see the victory of the evil one on the outside. And that's attested through all of the scriptures. Why don't you go to Psalm 43 with me? Psalm 43. You need to mimic this. Watch and learn from Jesus. Psalm 43. Psalm 43 verses one through five give us great insight. 42 is very close to it if you wanna mark that down, but 43 is where we're gonna go. 
Very similar truth, Psalm 43, verses one through five. Just listen to how the psalmist talks and see if you can't hear the words of Christ behind some of these things. Psalm 43, verse one. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. And right now I'm reading the psalm and I'm going, man, this is good. Man, this is encouraging. I'm glad he's going to God to find this strength. Then he says, why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? See, there's times where the psalmist feels like God has turned his back on him. Where God's not in control, where he's not doing what he said he's going to do. So what does the psalmist do then? Does he just give up? Does he just kind of play the victim, blame somebody else? No, he continues to wrestle. Notice what he asks, verse 43. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Not the oppression, not the mourning, not the weakness. If those things lead me, I will stay in despair. But send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling. And in prayer, the psalmist is wrestling with God to provide him the strength and perspective and power to be able to handle the oppression that's coming up against him. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Look at verse five. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. See, the psalmist is doing the same thing that Jesus did. Go to him, appeal to his character, trust him, ask boldly for what you want, but humbly submit to whatever his will is. Because that's exactly what he's taught us to do over and over again. Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me, not my feelings, not the oppressors. What you want me to do, God. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 1. We'll see the same thing. Mimicking the prayer of Jesus here. What do you do when you feel this great sorrow? Second Corinthians chapter 1. You know, I told you as I've been dealing with this hardship in my family, what an encouragement this passage has been to me. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. This is Paul, I think, working out what Jesus has experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's working out all the stuff that God is doing behind the scenes. Notice this, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. If you've ever experienced any sort of grief, you will read those verses differently. The Father who's full of mercies and comfort. He comforts us, verse four, in all our afflictions, none. There is no affliction that you face that God won't send this with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which we experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Look at verse eight. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. This is the Apostle Paul facing great sorrow and struggle and distress. Why why did he have to go through this? What's the point of all this? But that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now do you see how God shifts and puts all these things together to work them all out according to his purposes? So the difficulties in our lives are not designed to steal our joy, but to increase it as we depend upon the God who has the power to raise the dead. If you're a Christian, you are a Christian because you believe in the resurrecting power of God who conquered death. 
And if death, the greatest weapon of the enemy, is conquered by God in what 1 Corinthians describes as the weakness and foolishness of God, imagine what the power of God could do if he just unleashed it in a moment. God can do all things. And when you pray to him that way, you are strengthened in your soul to continue on regardless if he takes your request or not. Because you're asking God to do what he wants to do because he knows what's best. Not to rely on ourselves, but on God. Watch this, verse 10. He delivered us from such deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope and he will deliver us again. We have to mimic the prayer of Jesus. This is exactly what he's doing as he's falling on his face in the garden, crying, God, my soul is at distress and it's burdened and it's weighty. God, I need you to remove this from me, but if you will not do that, let your will happen and I want to follow that. Can you mimic that prayer of Jesus? We got to think about this. And the more we begin to think about it and try to mimic it in our life, the better it is going to be for us. I was listening to a podcast called Historical Figures. And they just take a random uh, influential person from history and do a, a biography on him. And they did it on Bach, the great composer. And they were talking about his early com uh, compositions that he was putting together that he would teach to students or he would perform for other people. And everybody had the same complaint when it came to Bach. These are just, you're pushing the limits too far. You're trying to create such difficult music. This isn't enjoyable. This music, it should be beautiful and heavenly and it's, it's just so hard and difficult. No one is enjoying this process. So the, the podcast began to detail how he began to change. And what he did is he came across the works of Vivaldi, the violinist, who is known for beautiful musicality. And what Bach did is he began to transcribe a number, I think nine total, of Vivaldi's compositions. And spending time poring over, transcribing those, began to change his musical style from difficult and unwelcoming to beautiful and uplifting. Because he spent that time ruminating over it. When we look at Jesus, that should happen with us in our prayers. As I'm watching Jesus and I'm thinking, wow, there's my insufficiency in prayer. I'm asking more for my will than God's. I'm not unburdening myself. I'm not asking other people to pray for me. All of these different things, they should challenge us and, and conform us and, and make our prayers more like Christ, which is what we've said over the past couple of weeks is the goal of our discipleship, striving to be like the Savior who saved us. So let's mimic the prayer of Jesus here, guys. When you feel those moments of sorrow, when you feel those moments of grief, go to God and trust him. That's what your savior did for you. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.11. Notice how Paul wraps this whole thing up. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. That is a powerful verse. I hope you, you comprehend what's being said there. You must help us. Paul's saying, when I experience grief, when I experience sorrow, I'm looking to you to be a part of my team and pray for me. You need to ask God the same thing that I'm asking God for. And these many prayers need to come together in beautiful harmony so that God gives us a strength so that we can do what God is calling us to do. Notice that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted by us through the prayers of many. See, if you think you're just gonna take your sorrows to God and you're not gonna tell anybody about them, you're not doing what the Bible's telling you to do. You take them to brothers and sisters in Christ who care for you. I, I just can't tell you those people who I've been telling about what's going on in my family, calling me, texting me, praying with me, taking me to lunch. You can always take me to lunch. I'm always free to go to lunch. You just take me to lunch anytime you want. I'll go to lunch with you always. And you just tell me, you're praying for me, you pray with me. When we get victory through all of these different trials, who then is going to rejoice in what God has done? Is it just going to be me or is it going to be everybody who's prayed? That's why you must adopt this mindset. But what happened with Jesus? Go back to Mark 14. Did he have that same support system? We saw the prayer of Jesus. Now watch what happened in verse 37. After he pours out his heart to God and he's asked his disciples to watch with him. Notice what he says. Mark 14, 37. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, 
but the flesh is weak. So what was Jesus anticipating? That he'd have the support of his closest friends. That they would really understand what's going on. See, Jesus here, again, stressing his full humanity, knows what's coming, what's imminent, what's about to happen. And because he has that, there's a restlessness, a sleeplessness with Jesus. If the disciples really comprehended what was going on, I don't think they'd be asleep. Because you understand that. You understand that if there's something that you're, you're not looking forward to the next day, don't you have trouble sleeping? Isn't that just running through your mind constantly? Sleep is in, it escapes you at all costs. You try, you know, counting sleep. You listen to my sermons. Whatever you can do to put yourself asleep, you try it desperately to make sure that you get some sleep, but your mind is just focused on it. The disciples, if they really comprehended at this hour what was about to happen to Christ, do you think they'd be sleeping? I really don't think they know. They don't get it. So why did he bring Peter, James, and John? Well, remember, he's brought them along so far at some great moments Right when he, uh, I think it was Jairus' daughter, he brought, her, brought them in the back, Peter, James, and John, so he could heal the, the girl in the Mount of Transfiguration. Who was there? Peter, James, and John. So they've seen power and majesty with Christ. But now he wants to show them vulnerability. But they're not paying attention. And why specifically these three? Because who are the three so far that we have clear accounts of their dependency upon their own abilities, but Peter, James, and John. So let's write this down, number three, on our outline. Never depend on your own abilities. Number three, we need to never depend on our own abilities. If we're facing sorrow, struggle, hardship, distress, never depend on our own abilities. That's when you'll play the victim. That's when you'll be a defeatist. That's when you'll throw a pity party. And We can't do that. God's not calling us to that. He's calling us to go to him and to ask him and to depend on him so that when he grants the prayer of strength, he gets the glory for it. Never depend on your own abilities. How do we see that with Peter? Can you look at uh, chapter 14, verse uh, 29? Listen to Peter, 14, 29. Even though they all fall away, I will not. No mention of dependency upon God for that. I, Jesus, I'm here with you emphatically, he's going to swear, if I must die, I will not deny you. And you hear the I statement over and over again from Peter. What about James and John? Remember that nice, sweet moment? You thought tiger moms were bad in the 21st century? Think about James and John. The, uh, the, the mom is the one who comes up to Jesus and says, I need to get my sons at the right and left hand of you, so what do I got to do to get you here? So we have them asking this question, and Jesus goes, do you even know what you're asking? Was he asking them, are you able to drink the cup that I'm able and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized? And what are the three words? We are able. So these three disciples are very high on their own abilities. And God is bringing them to this point so that the Son of God can show them, don't depend on your own abilities. Depend upon God. Notice he starts with Simon Peter. You know, you're sleeping and I don't think there's any significance that he switched from Peter to Simon because sometimes he praises Simon and sometimes he scolds Simon. Sometimes he praises Peter, sometimes he scolds Peter. I think it's just so he doesn't have Peter twice in a row. Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So now that's expanded from the singular to the plural. So he's talking to Peter, James, and John. Watch and pray, which we learned at the end of chapter 13 is what all good disciples do. We have to be watchful, alert. God could come at any time. And how do we do that? By praying. Because now we're the most alert to God's will and we can find where we've misaligned or need realignment with that will of God. But we have Peter here and James and John not willing to do that. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. There are some commentators, this is a, a reference to the Holy Spirit. Because I think Jesus is, again, highlighting their inability. They're trying to depend on themselves. You could have the most willing spirit, but your flesh is weak. I think that because the two mentions of the Holy Spirit before, in chapter 13 and chapter 12, both say the Holy Spirit. Chapter 12, David spoke by the Holy Spirit. And then chapter 13, you will know what to say because the Holy Spirit will give it to you. Here we just have the Spirit. So I think he's talking about 
the human spirit. Yeah, you might have all the, the hope in the world that you're gonna stand, but your flesh is weak. You need to go to God. You need to be praying and ask for that strength. But even if it was the spirit, it still fits. Is the spirit of God willing to strengthen you if you go to God in prayer to help you accomplish what God wants you to do? Yes, absolutely. So if you don't go to that and you depend on your flesh, then you're gonna fail anyways. You get the same in the wash. But I think he's referencing the human spirit here. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Notice verse 39, and he went away and prayed again, saying the same words. That's comforting to me. See, we have in Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6, don't use vain repetition, right? That's what the Gentiles do. Don't just say it over and over again. But that doesn't mean we can't pray for the same thing over and over again if it comes from the right heart. So we have Jesus here, the exact same words, the same burden is there. God, all things are possible. Remove it, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he comes back again, and he finds them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. So the son of man is shouldering burdens, and these people have burdens on their eyelids to just keep them closed. And they did not know how to answer him. I love the honesty. I mean, you know this has got to be a historical account here. What, what would you say to Jesus if you failed him twice? I have no excuse. I'm just simply relying upon myself here. The disciples can't answer him anything, and he goes away a third time, verse 41. And then he comes back again after praying, and he said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus asked that rhetorical question, are you still sleeping? How could you be doing that? Then he has that phrase, is it enough, which is an interesting word because they translated it as if it goes with the first statement, is it enough, which is not really the normal use of that word. If you translate it that way, it makes sense. It's enough for you to sleep. Stop sleeping, get up, it's time to go. But if you translate the word where it's more faithfully translated towards the other ones, you could translate the statement with two different rhetorical questions. Are you still sleeping? Yes, you are. Is not my betrayer eminent, close? Is not the time close is the way you could say that. Is it enough or is it not close? Is the time not here right now? Shouldn't you be awake then is the way I think you should translate that. The hours come, it's right here. The son of man is betrayed, handed over, as he said, on the road to Jerusalem, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, see my betrayers at hand. You know what I love about that? Does that sound really vulnerable or more like a commanding officer right there? See, I think Jesus is showing the strength that he received in Luke 22 when the angels came and ministered to him after the prayer. He boldly now stands in front of his disciples, knowing the betrayers over there, and is going to walk triumphantly towards him, not running, cowering in fear, because he's prayed to God. He's now instructing the disciples, come on, get up, follow me, and I'm going to be that shepherd. I'm going to let this guy do this to me. I give my life as a ransom for many. I love the confidence that he has. You know what's so interesting about this? What did Jesus say was going to happen? Peter, you will deny me three times. How many opportunities to pray did Peter miss? Three opportunities to pray. And then in a moment, we're going to see all three failures happen. But don't you see the connection there with our inability to handle temptation? If we don't pray, if we don't go to God, we don't ask for strength, we don't ask for his will, I think the evidence is right here in the text for us. It's not bad if you experience times of sorrow if you handle them correctly because God is going to use them and craft them to make you more like his son. But we can't sit back and play a victim. We can't have the mentality that this is not fair because the ultimate example of not being fair is the son of God living a perfect life and dying on the cross, not for sins of his own, but for yours and yours and yours. When you think of it that way, all things that God is in control over will work out for good and we can trust him because he's always been good to us. So what I think we need to do as disciples of Jesus Christ is to let this prayer cause us to love Jesus more because of how amazing he is, but drive us to hone our prayers to be more like his and never depend on our own abilities. And when we do that, watch God do incredible things with this community of believers who believe that all things are possible with God. Let's go to him right now and ask that he would give us the grace to do that. Father, it is our, our privilege to come before you 
and God to, to ask and make bold requests. James tells us you have not because you ask not. It's got nothing to do with us, Father. It's got nothing to do with your inability, but it has everything to do with our, our lack of faith that you really want us to pray. God, you do want us to do that. You want us to, as the psalmist says, pour out our hearts before you in Psalm 62. So God, may we be a church known for doing that, but God, not because we want to, to have a pity party thrown for us, not because we want to victimize ourselves, but because, Father, we're looking for answers in a world that seems to be so anti your honor and glory because that's what we desire. God, thank you that in Christ we can come to you and I pray that we would have a, a bigger vision than just what's happening to us, but how we can live for the glory and honor of the one who died in our place because he was that perfect substitute, the sinless son of God we are able to worship you without fear of condemnation, but God, in the true fear of who you are. So thank you for that, God. I pray that right now as we get ready to sing together and go fellowship, as we go to the tiller days and we get to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we, we would do so confidently, Father, knowing that you are good and ready to forgive. So Father, take these moments of praise right now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.